All right, well, welcome. This is the Vietnam Gallery. And this is the last gallery that we have that is presently a campaign type of gallery. So, the Vietnam era started in the early 60s. It had first started out as a police action. It was then uh, a volunteer action where we were providing aid, military aid and training to the Vietnamese. It then was escalated in the late 60s. And one of the first uh, big operations was Operation Shoe Fly. If you come to the museum, you can see some of the aircraft that actually participated in Operation Shoe Fly, and one of them is in our Leatherneck Gallery. So the helicopters became, this became a helicopter war. It was probably the most use of helicopters in any involvement that we had had up to that point in time. So the helicopters, helicopters like these, which were replaced by CH-46s, which are a little bigger, and the CH-53s, that with our two very capable aircraft, the F-4 and the A-4, one being an attack aircraft and the other being a fighter aircraft. And the advantage of getting wounded, picking them up, medevacking them, it improved the uh, saving of, of a lot of Marines' lives by the fact that we got them to battalion aid stations in a lot quicker fashion, the medevacs. So almost any time an aircraft landed, people were getting off and wounded were getting on. It was just the, the way things were going. Now in here, we have what is called the tinfoil airstrip. The engineers would put these together in a matter of 20 to 30 days, and we could create a tactical airstrip and you'll see it when you come to the museum that we have a model over there that shows that we can actually trap an aircraft, which is like landing on an aircraft carrier, and then shoot it into the sky by putting rocket assist JATO bottles, jettison assist takeoff, on the tail end of the, those A4s. So this way, in a short period of time, in about 25 days, we could flatten the space, put this tinfoil airstrip together, start landing aircraft on a short field and having aircraft take off on a short, short runway. So it became very good from a tactical standpoint. And as we come around here, you're going to see the weapons of the day. Many of our veterans will remember the M14 and the M16 and the M60 machine guns over here. And over on this side, some of the Vietnamese, Chinese and Russian that were used, in fact, that number 10 there is an AK-47 version of, Chinese version of the AK-47. So these are actual weapons that were used. We have a, a village here that gives you a little bit of idea how it was like in a Vietnamese village. They, like in the Second World War, were at Iwo Jima, they had tunnels underneath the ground. As you can see, the Viet Cong and the Vietnamese they had many of their villages were built on top of tunnels and they stored stuff down there. They stayed down there and they would infiltrate and take over some of these villages. So when the uh, Americans came through, you knew that there was Viet Cong in the area, but you just couldn't always find them. So we used dogs like over here and tunnel rats that actually sole function was to look into tunnels and see if any of these uh, were occupied at the time. Over here we have some of the booby traps. We have the famous bungee pit, which were bamboo stakes that would be put in a walking path covered with reeds and branches. So as you walked over it, it caved in and it would cause, uh, cause injury. Most of the time it wouldn't kill you probably, but it would take you out of the, out of the combat situation. As we move forward over here, You'll see the, battle, the Tet Offensive of 1968 in the battle for Hue City, which was a basically a street to street, to street house to house type of battle. You see one of our more famous guards. This guy's been on duty for a long time. He's got an M79 grenade launcher here, right here. And you see the Antos. The Antos is a recoilless rifle. Uh, six, of, uh, six of them on top, so you have a good, the gunners on the outside, machine gunner, 
The driver is the only one who's inside the tank. Marine infantry loved this because it provided quite a bit of support and also was very, very powerful uh, against, uh, against the enemy. As we come into the, uh, the northern part of uh, Vietnam was the, most of the area up by the DMZ that the Marines were responsible for. And one of the more famous battles was the Battle of Quezon in 1968. So what we're going to do is we're going to go up the ramp here and we're going to go through a simulated landing of a helicopter on the Hill 881. Now Hill 881 was a tactical area. So what will happen here, you'll come in here, this aircraft simulates a landing on top of the Hill 881. So when you come down, you walk down, it shakes, it rattles, it rolls, it's got a sound, it's got a little bit of a smell, so that you'll get the idea of how it was to go down the ramp onto a tactical area. So Hill 881, Marines were, this was their permanent permanent home. It was a, an outpost from uh, the Quezon battlefield. It was self-supporting. It had its own armory, communications, artillery, machine gun, mortar. And the whole idea was this area was very close to the DMZ. So the, the Viet Cong and the Vietnamese would try and attack this place. It was elevated. Hill 881 was somewhat elevated and it provided quite a bit of protection. But it was not a tactical position. It was more of a, an outpost to prevent the further attack on the, on the combat base at Quezon. And as you leave, you'll exit out through here. You'll go through, and you'll see, see some videos that will give you an idea of how it was to, uh, to defend Hill 881. Everything came in and everything came out via helicopter. If the helicopter was on the ground for more than about 25 seconds, it was in jeopardy of being, of being destroyed. So they worked out a system in order to land these aircraft, get them empty, get them full, and get them out in, this, in a 25 second period of time. So you'll see a lot more than this when you come and visit uh, the Vietnam Gallery, and I hope to see you in the, in, in the, in the museum very soon.